Okay. Great. So uh, uh, I'm going to spend about 15 minutes going over some uh, typical investigation considerations on the structural side uh, with all of the stuff uh, that you've, you've heard today, kind of building on that, and then we'll break for lunch. Uh, the, uh, one of the things that we always have to look at with masonry buildings is, is, is the problem actually not... Yeah. I, okay. I was going to make sure those people are here. Okay. I was going to... Okay. <laughs> so uh, uh, the, uh, but one of the things we look at is the foundation movement. And uh, a lot of times we'll go out and we'll do a floor survey to see if the foundation is moving and uh, that might be causing the cracks itself. And that's a whole separate world, but I'm going to touch on it just to give you an illustration if you have a building. Uh, you, the effect of vegetation and roof uh, rainwater can uh, be significant with expansive soil. Uh, you have water that can cause, uh, let me go back, can cause the edges to heave and raise up and can cause cracking making a bowl shaped foundation. Or you can have the effect of trees as they grow with time. They uh, will start to desiccate, start to suck out the moisture out underneath the foundation, and you can have settlement of expansive soil decreases in volume. And uh, these are things that need to be studied. Uh, typical, uh, uh, let me see here. I've got to get this uh, other one up. Hmm. Bear with me here. Okay, get the right one, and yes, so, right, moving, removing trees will cause a rebound effect where it used to be sucking out moisture and now it'll raise up, exactly. Uh, typical foundation investigation equipment uh, will include zip levels, uh, pressurized levels, crack gauges, where you'll uh, put a... Uh, uh, something on both sides of a crack. It'll have a crosshairs on one side and uh, it'll have a grid on the other. And uh, you epoxy it to both sides of the crack and as the crack opens and changes, you'll be able to tell the nature of it. Is it rotating? Is it just moving evenly out? And that can sometimes tell you the nature of the source of the cracking. 3D laser scanning is more recent equipment that uh, for historical restorations of terracotta, you can look at the small subtle effects uh, long term of significant historical structures with that kind of system. Uh, masonry investigation equipment, I'm going to go through a series of uh, slides that uh, Mike Schuler gave me. He, uh, he deals with much more sophisticated equipment than I do on uh, a regular basis. And uh, uh, he'll talk more this ap after lunch today, but this is an overview of the types of, of techniques that you can use in an investigation. You can use visual uh, evaluation and, and you can see all the things you might scrape and hit masonry with. Uh, you've got surface hardness uh, rebound hammer that uh, you can have a standardized test, uh, compare soft spots to hard spots, mortar hardness evaluation, and uh, uh, there are different uh, standardized tests for that as well. Resistance drilling to see how hard uh, the resistance is. If you have a very soft mortar, a very hard mortar, it might tell you the age because of cement-based or lime sand-based mortar. Data visualization, uh, pulse velocity testing. These are some uh, uh, Test where they'll uh, t have a, a, a vibration through a material, and from that they can uh, back out calculations, uh, and back out by calculation uh, modulus of elasticity and other properties sometimes. And uh, you can use that for wood with two probes far apart, and you hit a, a rebound hammer. Uh, pulse velocity testing, um, uh, that's what they'll look like with the probe in the bottom left corner there. Ultrasonic uh, velocity testing with direct transmission. Uh, this is from the uh, Basilica of Assumption. Lots of pictures of Mike in here, by the way. <laughs> Sounding hammers. Uh, and uh, this is an ASTM, a practice for measuring delaminations in bridge decks. Uh, there's a chain drag, you know, where it sounds just, names just like it sounds. You drag a chain across or you hammer. Uh, microwave radar. Uh, this is um, uh, GPR, ground penetrating radar. Uh, infrared thermography, which uh, Gordon showed a lot of good examples of that. And uh, you can tell a lot of the structural characteristics of what's reinforced or grouted. X-ray investigations uh, with standard X-ray equipment. Um, you can use these for all materials, not just masonry, and see hidden connections and details. Metal detectors. We talked a little bit a while ago about those ferroscans, handheld devices where you can detect what's in the wall. 
uh, you know, corroded steel will not give a signal like uh, bare regular steel. And so sometimes that alone can tell you the condition of corrosion, uh, at least give you a clue. And uh, boroscopes are where you have a small hole where you'll have a, a you see these, uh, it's like a, a snake that goes in this little uh, half inch diameter hole, for example, maybe. And through that, you might be able to, if you have a, the fancy kind like Al does, and whenever I need it, I go borrow, I have uh, Al come over and he, I borrow his. Uh, where it can uh, go in, and turn inside of a cavity and, and it has a light and it's attached to a camera. So they get very fancy ones uh, uh, or very limited ones. Electrochemical methods, uh, in situ tests, you know, where you're actually doing something in the sample. Mike, actually, do you have your flat jack uh, with you? You want to? Okay. Mike, uh, uh, his firm is, uh, uh, has a flat jack equipment and uh, we probably have a, uh, yeah, flat jack testing. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so Mike could talk for you, to you about this for, what, about 10 hours, <laughs> if someone wanted. <laughs> but you'll, slit, you'll sit, slip these inside of a bed joint, and there's really primarily two tests that are done. One is to find out uh, if you have two flat jack you know, pieces of equipment, uh, you can uh, determine the compressive strength of the masonry by doing a test on the sample in the wall, or at least you can find its uh, properties up to a certain point of stress. Uh, by, they'll have pressure that will inflate this uh, diaphragm that's this is like a calzone, kind of, more like a, than a flat jack. Steel calzone. We need to rename that thing. Okay, uh, and then if you, have, uh, if you have just one, you can use it to determine the in situ stresses, which are great if you want to uh, understand uh, where the, what's actually holding up the wall. And uh, uh, this is uh, pictures of it, and in situ deformability, uh, determine the stiffness, the strength in place, and uh, get hysteresis curves. Uh, in situ uh, shear tests as well. Uh, there's actually a shear bond test that men it's mentioned in the International Existing Building Code. And in some cases, if you read between the lines, uh, it's actually required to run certain cases. Um, different this is actually a more mechanical, practical hands-on where you, you uh, expose and then you have a wrench that you, you physically wrench and you measure the force it took to wrench it out from the wall where you measure its flexural strength. And the flexural strength of unreinforced masonry can be exceedingly good if you have a, a good quality uh, mason who understands good bond and has through you, generations of experience kn know, and with materials knows what it takes to get that. But when you compare it to today's uh, people who are uh, simply laborers who are uh, applying mortar and not paying attention to that, especially where we, we have reinforcement, uh, you find that the, the product you actually get is significantly weaker in flexural strength than you used to get with, with other, other mortars and masonry. Uh, oh, these are some examples of prism tests. Uh, with masonry, the term masonry prism is different than a grout prism. Uh, but this is a masonry prism where you have an assemblage of two units and a mortar joint. And you can actually take units from the field and you can uh, mock up in a laboratory and do a test on a sample by itself. Uh, you have mortar cubes that you can use. As I mentioned earlier, it's strongly recommended that you don't misuse the data from mortar cubes. Uh, the strength you get from that is more of a general character indication. It's not intended to be a minimum strength like you have for concrete cylinders. There are a lot of reasons for that. Um, the, uh, I'll also uh, re uh, give you an example of a case study in deductive reasoning. And uh, uh, this is a, a case where there was a problem and there was a repair done. And then there were some more problems that were related to that repair and trying to figure all of that out. The, the, you can, I'm giving you this as an example. Usually uh, existing buildings are never as simple as that's just the way they built it originally. It's always somebody changed this and then years later somebody else changed this. And then for 30 years it was unoccupied and nobody maintained it. And then water you know, got in through the roof and there was dry rot fungus. So here's an example. You have the original problem. Uh, where you see cracks, uh, uh, you can see the cracking pattern. I don't know if it's, you can see it because it's kind of dark. And uh, uh, there was a crack on the arch. Now, as, as uh, Andreas mentioned, you know, arches, they, they take the compression and then they'll, they'll spread it laterally as this is all in compression. When you find that uh, there's a crack, the crack happens in, because of tension, okay? And so uh, even in a compression element, it'll crack because of uh, tension in the, in the element stress level. And so that means that something is, uh, this is not a pure arch anymore. And so that's because of the distortion that we were observing, where you can see how this is kicked out in that, that column on the end. 
So when you have a series of, of arches, it's often uh, common to find a problem with the last column on each end. And why is that? Well, because you'll have a thrust that's not counterbalanced. If you have a series of arches, all of the intermediate columns have two counteracting equal thrusts, in, in, and so they, they brace each other. But on the abutments at the end, you can find you'll have distress if they're not designed for that. And you can see this column is, is, does not have a, a very fat aspect ratio. It's a very tall and skinny element. And so if you were to push on that element, you could see that it would not be a great abutment. And so that was part of, of the problem. The uh, corner was reconstructed, and these are plans from when it was reconstructed. And you can see that uh, the original masonry was all unreinforced brick solid masonry. Whereas the, the new construction reused the existing bricks, bought some new bricks, but infilled it with concrete grout and reinforcement. So this element here was very different in character from the original masonry, all right? And uh, you may remember how we, we talked about how that can lead to problems. Uh, the problem that happened after the reconstruction some years was some of these uh, stone water table elements fell off and uh, then they shored them up. And uh, uh, you can see from this picture here that there was a cast stone anchor and it failed. There was a slit in the top of the stone, but it, it, it rotated out and that's why it fell. It, whereas it was not a problem for 100 years, it became a problem a few years after the reconstruction. So why would that happen? There was other distress, the, the segments of the actual column itself. This is a load bearing column, we're shifting. Uh, you can find there were also other cracks. Uh, some of these uh, br uh, brick units fell from the arch. And, uh, and you could see that the top of this uh, uh, cast stone column uh, was sliding about an inch uh, at the top. And you can see here's that joint where this was all new and this was all existing masonry. And you can not only see the difference in materials, but you can see how there's a crack forming. And this is, uh, is not, uh, not giving. It's, it's a much more rigid element because it's concrete. So the theory of movement here, uh, looking at it, is when you account for the fact that it was spread footings on a foundation, and spread footings are always very sensitive to uh, foundation movements, more than a, a stiffened slab on grade, for example, where you have a, 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 or a continuous footing. Uh, you can also see how um, there's a, what's called downhill creep when you have sloped surfaces with expansive clay. And that is that the soil wants to expand perpendicular to the slope as it's all pressing on itself. Whereas expansive soil on a slope will want to shrink and go down towards the center of the earth with gravity. And so over time, that, serious, that series of progressions from annual wet and dry seasons can cause what's, uh, what we call downhill creep. And so we believe that had a, a big impact because the original uh, foundation, I mean, excuse me, the original site was a slope surface. And the borings indicated that ge geologically, that's what the, the strata looked like. Whereas they came in and they filled on top. So even though you may see a relatively flat site, the original soil uh, down below was, was sloped. And you put all that together, uh, and you can see that this rigid element, when you look at the side, here's the, this is looking at the end of that series of columns with the arches. And so this element here, because it had no support, uh, it was rotating out. That rotation caused that water table to, uh, that, that stone water table to lose its, its anchorage and then fall. And, and uh, we, we modeled the elements and, and came up with a similar distortion that was observed uh, by the rotation of this element here. There are other related issues I want to touch on. Uh, lime sand mortar is something that was used historically, let's say, 100 years ago. It didn't have the cement as a common material. And lime sand mortar is uh, uh, very different than cement mortar. Cement mortar uh, will last a lot longer, and it's very hard and brittle. Lime sand mortar is much more of a ductile material, which means it'll yield before, um, before it, uh, it fails, like you could say. So uh, a lime sand mortar um, is, is good in that regard. However, uh, if you have a, a, an old building and you haven't maintained the lime sand mortar, it'll erode a lot faster because the water will pick up the lime and it'll deposit it on the surface. And so you'll essentially have sand. And it's very common you go into some of these old buildings where literally with your finger you can swipe an inch deep and just swipe away that mortar. That's a lime sand mortar where the lime has been washed out. Washed out by water migration. And Gordon really covered very well how water can move through a wall system and how you can observe that. And the, uh, uh, the, the, the classification of what type of mortar you have in a building is absolutely critical if you're going to repoint it. 
Because if you take a, a lime sand mortar, you know, triple wide, three layer brick building, a wall system, and you point it with cementitious mortar on the surface, then you will trap moisture in it, whereas it used to breathe. And so then you can, you can aggravate the problem, and, but, and even worse, you don't see it. And so you can have uh, caves inside of your, uh, inside of your wall system. Uh, a lot of times people will put um, uh, under fire, when people built buildings originally 100 years ago, the methods of creating brick, which is uh, by heat uh, in an oven, uh, today are much more, more efficient and uniform with gas-fired kills. Whereas 100 years ago, you'd have more uh, 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 hand uh, stove uh, with wood uh, burning uh, kills. And those are much more uh, inconsistent in the firing. And so it was common practice to use the less fired, the underfired, the weaker brick on the interior wide, and then the better uh, brick on the exterior because that's what received the, the weathering face. Now that's, in, that's in, it's important to know because if you're looking at a structure where there was a series of buildings on a, down, on a downtown Main Street Avenue, and one of the buildings had a roof collapse, which is very common at time, and then uh, let's say they demolished that building, well, what was an interior face is now an exterior face. And so you can have significant aggravated problems if that's not protected properly. The uh, 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 existing lateral restraint anchors and braces are sometimes encountered where over time they saw a problem and they tried to do something about it. Uh, you can see steel plates on the face of brick where they're called patris plates. And uh, you can have anchors that, that connect them through the building. And sometimes they're hidden, you don't even see them. And, but they're there because shortly after the building was built, a problem arose. Rising damp is a, 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 a lay term for when water uh, will wick itself up the bottom of a wall, especially if you have masonry that's bearing directly on the ground rather than a concrete footing, which would be like a capillary break. Uh, you have here masonry where it can just directly allow that water trans to migrate up, evaporate out on the surface. A big sign of this is efflorescence. Efflorescence is when salt uh, will um, get picked up in, in the water of inside masonry, so it'll become soluble uh, and the, water, the salt will be inside the water. And then as the water gets to the surface and it wants to deposit, it cannot take the solid material of salt with it. And so it'll, it'll precipitate chemically and you'll have the water evaporate out, but the salt will be on the surface. So it pulls the salt through as it migrates. And you can have a buildup of that. Chemically, efflorescence uh, will become like limestone if it reacts with the air over time. That's why it's important as regular maintenance to remove efflorescence. Uh, the uh, plaster uh, that you sometimes see on historic structures often was added after the fact because of problems that were observed. And that's actually just like cement uh, pointing, cement-based mortar repointing, you'll trap water in the wall and you can make it worse. And if you try to remove the plaster in a restoration project, for example, you may find that you destroy the face of the brick that was, that was plastered. So sometimes there's really not a good answer, <laughs> but these are the problems we're warning you about. And uh, with that, uh, you'll have a report after you do all your investigation. And uh, with that, uh, I think we're going to break for lunch. <laughs>